Today, Chief Justice Thomas Bomber and Justice Paul de Munez will discuss what a healthy court system looks like and what we can do to sustain it. With an eye toward the 2013 legislative session, the justices will discuss the role of the courts, update us about the present state of Oregon state courts, and give us an idea of what the future might hold. Chief Justice Bomber was elected by his colleagues as Oregon's 43rd Chief Justice and began service on May 1, 2012. Before his appointment to the court in 2001, he practiced with the Portland law firm of Ader Wynn and its predecessor, Lindsay Hart Neal and Weigler, and also served as managing partner. Chief Justice Bomber has participated in various international legal programs, worked with judges and schools on law-related education internationally, and spoke to judges and court administrators through the Russian-American Rule of Law Consortium. Justice Demunez was elected to the Oregon Supreme Court in 2000 and served as the court's chief justice and administrative head of the Oregon Judicial Department from January 2006 until May of this year. Justice de Munez speaks frequently to both national and international audiences on the importance of maintaining independent state judiciaries, improving state court administration, and the need for adequate state court funding. Prior to ascending to the bench, Justice de Munez was in private practice for 13 years with the Salem, Oregon law firm of Garrett Siederman, Herman Robertson, and de Munez. And without further ado, please help me welcome Justice, Chief Justice Bomber and Justice de Munez. Thanks, Pat. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here uh, at the City Club. My membership lapsed uh, when I started commuting to Salem uh, some years ago, but I do miss these Friday forums and I miss the, the committees that I worked on when I was a, a City Club member as a, as a young lawyer practicing. Uh, in Portland. And so it, it's a real privilege for us to be here and we appreciate uh, your giving us uh, this forum to talk about these important issues. Uh, Pat teed it up well and, and we do want to talk about what the attributes of a healthy state court system are and what we can do to uh, try and develop those attributes uh, in, in Oregon. Uh, but I thought that, that first uh, what we would do would uh, it would be good to sort of get some basics out there so we have a common understanding of what's going on in the state courts, what we do. We have a number of lawyers here uh, and everybody else is a, is a very involved citizen. Uh, it's a sophisticated audience. So you folks know that although the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, gets most of the ink and the federal courts get a lot of ink, uh, both in terms of issues of importance to Oregonians, public policy issues, and in terms of what happens to individuals in the court every day, it's the state courts where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and the statistics are that more than 95% of litigation uh, is in the state courts. We try thousands of jury trials, civil trials, criminal trials every year, uh, we have hundreds of people coming in every day uh, into state courts across uh, Oregon, and uh, it really is the state courts that make a difference as to whether justice is being realized uh, in, uh, in this state or not, uh, and in this country or not. Uh, you know, we usually think about the three kind, you know, two kinds of cases. We've got civil cases, we've got criminal cases. Another way to look at them is we've got law violations. We have uh, huge numbers of cases uh, on the criminal side ranging from traffic violations to uh, fish and wildlife rule violations, small amounts of marijuana, up to identity theft, rape, aggravated murder. We've got the economic cases and uh, as those of you who are business lawyers either on the litigation side or the transaction side know, one of the reasons that our economy functions as well as it does is we, because we have a good forum for protecting uh, economic rights uh, and we have laws regarding debts, we have laws regarding the way business uh, is to be played, we have regulations that get enforced uh, in the state courts. So we've got uh, economic cases which really includes tort, tort cases, insurance disputes, uh, contract litigation, we've got business cases involving trade secrets, securities, uh, commercial contracts, and then we have a whole other category of cases that the judges and legal aid lawyers here know about, but the, the business lawyers may not pay much attention to, and those are the cases involving 
people in crisis, uh, people in uh, dissolution situations, people who are unable to take care of their children, people who need custody orders or uh, child support orders. We have a large number of and growing number of cases involving uh, Family Abuse Pre Prevention Act uh, and other restraining order statutes that allow people who are threatened by others with bodily harm to come in and get a restraining order. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, some of the ways we're dealing with those cases a little bit later. We have guardianship cases, used to involve mostly younger children, now a lot of them involve elder members of our society. Uh, we've got civil commitment proceedings. We have in the Oregon courts 600,000 cases every year, 600,000. Uh, and some of those are violations that are handled quickly and cheaply, but tens of thousands of those are serious disputes involving family matters, involving serious crimes, involving important uh, uh, business disputes and property disputes uh, for individuals and businesses. So where, where is uh, the Oregon judiciary right now? We have 191 judges. We operate uh, 36 circuit courts, one in every county. We have 27 judicial districts, so in some rural areas we have one district that covers several counties. We have a permanent staff of about 1,500 people supporting our 191 judges. That's down actually about 200 employees from five years ago. Uh, we have a, a two-year budget of about $420 million, about 367 for you budget crunchers, numbers crunchers, 367 million or so. Uh, from the general fund. It seems like a lot of dollars, but we are less than three cents out of every dollar in general fund expenditures. Three cents out of every dollar. And think about this as we talk a little bit about budget and as you hear budget discussions uh, over the coming months, because m amounts of money, five, 10, 15 million dollars, that make a huge difference in court operations are really rounding errors for some of the big recipients of general fund money, such as K through 12 education uh, or the human services budget. So that's a little bit about the statistics of where we are now. I'm often asked, what's the state of the Oregon courts in 2012? And the, the fact is the state is we are functioning, but we are stressed. This is a stressed court system. Uh, it's stressed because of the demands placed on it by new kinds of cases, and it's stressed because of the reductions in our budget uh, over the past five years. Uh, it is fraying at the edges. We frankly are not providing the kind of full-time access to justice around the state uh, that we ought to be providing. So we are functioning, we are doing what we do quite well, but the system uh, is in stress. Now, we knew, we knew since about 2008, as the stock market fell apart and the economy uh, started to uh, uh, go into decline, that we were going to be facing these uh, budget issues and budget cuts, and we were going to have to be doing some things differently uh, starting at that time. Uh, Paul was the Chief Justice at this point, and I'm gonna, we're going to sort of pass this back and forth, and it might be a little bit awkward, but. Uh, I, I think we both have some, some points we want to make uh, that, uh, that we hope will be uh, of interest to you. But, Paul, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the policies that, uh, that you put in place and the values that, uh, that sort of guided you as we looked at the, the budget yeah. problems that we're going to be facing in 2008. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, I want to reinforce uh, Tom's uh, earlier note to all of you. Uh, how privileged we are to be here and have the opportunity to, to talk with you. Um, when this uh, opportunity came up, I told Tom, I said, look, I'm not chief anymore. <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> no, we, um, I, I think uh, Tom has uh, given you a great, a great background. Um, I, I want to give us, as we go into kind of what's gone on, uh, is it, to give you something to, to think about, is just to remember this basic point. This is the branch of government that cannot fund its own operations and cannot enforce its own orders. Nothing, you can find nothing in the Constitution, 
intended to guarantee the institutional independence of the court system. You can find something in the Constitution to guarantee decisional independence, but there is nothing in the Constitution that guarantees you an adequate budget, that, that, that guarantees you what I would consider institutional independence or sustainable funding. So when I became chief, soon, really soon after I became chief, um, in I first had to tackle the question about our judicial compensation. And I know that there are many of you in this room. Um, this was the first time that we had reached out to the business community. And there are many of you in this room who were very, very helpful to me as, as we went to the legislature and for the first time in, I think we'd gone uh, seven and a half or eight years without any kind of, a, of an adjustment in compensation. So the business community was, was vital to that. But I soon came to realize that we were heading to, to use the, today's word, uh, a physical cliff. Um, that, that the budget reductions that we would be facing were not going to go away in the, in, in the next biennium or the next biennium. And that we, as a court system, needed to help ourselves. And so the first thing we did, and we were one of the, we're now a national model, um, uh, we were one of the f first courts to engage in strategic planning. And we actually went through a very rigorous strategic planning effort. And what it did for us was identified our core functions so that when these budget reductions started to come, we had already in place an objective way of looking at how we would prioritize our reductions. So in addition to strategic planning, it also became very clear to me that arguments by the judicial branch to the legislature that you need to adequately fund us um, because we're a separate co-equal branch of government f had fallen basically on deaf ears a and that we needed to help ourselves and that we needed to re-engineer our court system to squeeze every efficiency modernly that we could to leverage our technology that we already had and, and, to, get, and to get greater technology to continue to make the courts more accessible and efficient as we went. And so we formulated something we called the, you know, every, everybody has an acronym. Uh, ours was, was the Court Reengineering and Efficiencies Work Group, known as CRU. <laughs> we, we, um, I visited all 27 judicial district and, districts and talked with all 1,600 employees about my vision of how we could start to re-engineer the courts so that we could operate more efficiency on less revenues, knowing that, that our budget reductions were going to become increasingly severe. And in order to do that, the first thing we had to do is you, you as all of you know, who are in leadership positions, you have to start at the top. And so the first thing that I had started looking at really um, from even before I became chief was how the job description and things had changed for our staff. Um, and now think about this branch of government. We're the branch of government that believes in precedent. We believe in stare decisis, right? So we believe in what happened yesterday we ought to do today. So it's very difficult to confront your traditions and your, and, and your culture. But the first thing um, that we looked at was that each justice on the Supreme Court had their own judicial assistant. Seven justices, seven judicial assistants. Well, that was probably necessary when they were typing 50-page opinions. And I know Tom's going to say, gee, Paul, you just wrote one that was 80. Um, <laughs> 50-page opinions with an Underwood typewriter with onion skin copies. But that's not the reality in which we lived in. And through attrition and planning, we now operate in the Supreme Court with seven justices and three judicial assistants. Not only that, because we have a state-of-the-art uh, electronic 
case management system in the appellate courts, we were able to transfer all kinds of electric or, or uh, electronic or technology oriented case management duties. They're done now by those three judicial assistants. That was the equivalent of creating two more new jobs in the records department without any more money. On a much broader scale, and I see that uh, Gene Maurer is here, Judge Maurer was presiding judge in Multnomah County, and talk about confronting our traditions and culture. Under her leadership, she rearranged the judicial, the, uh, judicial assistant process in Multnomah County and required that each judicial assistant put in 25% of their time in operations. That was the equivalent of, of creating seven new jobs in operations without any additional money, seven FTE. We did that all over the state. Um, now, everyone knows, in addition to all the other budget cutting things, as soon as we did that and we saved $13 million, the legislature took it. They, 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 took, they took every bit of it, and then in the next session, they took the equivalent in our FTE. That's why Tom was saying we're, we're down now uh, over five years, uh, almost two, 200 employees. But we have been able to leverage our technology in, in, and one of the things that I, th I think we're, we should be most proud of, and Judge Waller, now the presiding judge, has been involved in this, the legislature has fully funded our e-court project. And we have a, f a fully operational um, uh, e-court in both the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. That means we have e-filing of all the briefs, notices, documents, we have electronic case management, and we have electronic content management, meaning we can see all the documents, we can do that, and we rolled out, what, Tom, was it Jan, uh, June? Ju uh, June, yeah. Yeah, June. We I, I, I became Chief Justice, and we rolled it out the next week. Yeah. So, <laughs> in, in, in the trial courts. It, it took uh, me six years. I don't it, think it so. It took me six years, and Tom did it in a week. <laughs> so, um, but we, we, have our, we have our first uh, um, e-court in, uh, in Yamhill County, and we, I think uh, within yeah. months, we'll, right. yeah, uh, we will have five uh, early adopter courts um, that we're, we're moving through. So we have centralized all of our prison litigation. It's all done, in, in uh, most of it in Marion County. I think we have still some in Multnomah, but we're talking about moving, moving all that. We do it all electronically. We transport no prisoners anymore. It's all done by video. We have saved millions and millions of dollars in, in paper, in postage, in records. All of our records now throughout the state on appeal are all done electronically. So we planned for that, and, but we have wrung out of the system. We've cleaned all the change out of our pockets. We've looked under every cushion for every coin we can find. And Tom is right. We're in a stressed system. In, in uh, uh, August of 2011, the New York Times said that Oregon was one of the best managed court systems in the country, but they had they, the, the continuous budget cuts were starting to stress us to the point, and I think Tom used a good word, that we're becoming frayed at the edges. There's things that you can't see. Um, I testified in front of the um, ABA task force on court funding in Atlanta a couple of years ago, and the Boston Globe picked up this quote of mine where I said, what your court systems across the country look like, they, 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 here's, the, here's, what, here's the analogy. It's like you have a tree dying in your front yard. You prop it up. It looks good with the landscape for the pass passers-by going by, but it's dying underneath and what you can't see behind. All the people who have to file everything, record everything, do all of that, we're in danger in that system. Tom, it's up to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, let me mention a couple of the <clears throat> aspects uh, of how we have dealt with and the problems that are arising from these budget cuts we've had. We, like the other, uh, much of the rest of state government, started doing furlough days about four years ago, and we managed to keep the courts open. We said we're going to have rolling furloughs even though DMV and these other offices are closed, we're going to stay open, but as we cut employees, we were no longer able to cover for the people who were on furlough. So 
the past two years, we have closed the courts on the days when the rest of state government was closed. That is an unacceptable situation. It is unacceptable to say to a woman who needs a restraining order against an abusive ex-spouse or boyfriend, uh, sorry, the courts are closed on Friday. You don't get the restraining order for this weekend. Come back on Monday. That may work in terms of renewing your driver's license. You can renew it on Thursday. You can renew it on Monday. But that's not acceptable uh, when somebody needs uh, a restraining order, when injunctions uh, are required, when somebody needs protection, when they need a custody order, a support enforcement order. Uh, we've got to do better than that. The courts need to be open every day. They need to be open nine hours a day. The other thing we're doing is we're closing uh, around the state courts certain hours of the day because we don't have enough employees, for example, to keep the window where you can go pay your fines or traffic tickets open at noon. Well, a lot of people want to come in at noon because that's, where they're on, that's when they're on lunch break. Uh, in Multnomah County, we close for half the day the uh, public records area where court records that ought to be available to the public uh, are, can be accessed by members of the public. We close those because we have so few staff folks there that we have to have them docketing uh, orders that have already been entered by the court and doing other filing activities and things that used to be done by the 200 employees who were laid off. Now, there are real world consequences to these sorts of cuts. Uh, not being able to get the restraining order, not getting your judgment, your money judgment, saying somebody owes you money so you can go and collect it. Uh, instead, you may not get it for three or five days or a week or two. Meanwhile, where did the money go? Um, we had a situation in Multnomah County recently where mother comes in, ex party, meaning for the non-lawyers, there no, was not time or ability to get the other party father into the courtroom. Mother says, I need uh, temporary custody of the child. Trial court listens, says, okay, temporary custody to mother. Later in the week, father comes in seeking temporary custody, ex party, but because we've been unable to get the order from the earlier proceeding uh, docketed, the, the different trial judge enters order for father. Well, that is a recipe for family conflict. It's a recipe for legal conflict. It's a recipe for uh, problems within the family and uh, in their relationship with the court system. I was contacted by a member of the legislature who said that in her rural uh, circuit court, uh, there was a, a family who were, they were unable to take care of the kids. Parents were drug addicts. Uh, one was in jail. Everybody agreed grandma should have uh, custody of the child. But we had cut our family law coordinator uh, who would help self-represented people fill out the paperwork, especially in an uncontested matter like this, and get the appropriate order. And grandma tried several times. She'd fill out the paperwork, turn it in, it would get rejected. She'd fill it out again, but there was nobody to sort of go through uh, the paperwork with her, and we're experiencing, as many of you uh, who have things or are involved in the court system know, many more self-represented people, and this is an example of a service that we should be providing to self-represented litigants that we've had to cut with uh, bad consequences for the courts, delay for the courts, extra work for the courts, and bad service for the people that need a court order. Paul, one, one thing that I, I would like you to talk about just for a minute is, uh, is the, the cuts we've made in terms of our research and analysis and development yeah. capability. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. I, I, I wanted to not leave our talk without bringing a prop, the, my iPad, and I just wanted you to know all the briefs filed uh, in the Oregon Supreme Court last year are on this little iPad. So that's part of our, of our electronic system. Uh, Tom is right. What we're getting, getting into is the whole concept is that we have, been, we have become used to this throughout the country as equating minimal funding with adequate funding. And that, I, I, we've got to try to continue to change that dialogue to sustainable funding. And one of the things, 
given our strategic planning and, and the core values that we identified, the things that weren't core were the priorities to go. So we've lost most of our training me mechanisms for judges. And you need, you know, we all know that an impartial, efficient, and competent court system is a key to a fully functioning free market economy. You have to be able to enforce your economic and property rights, and, and that, that is a gospel by every economist in the world. And we're, we've lost our education and training for our judges, and we are getting, we, we have a, a different group of people coming to the bench. And they're, they're generally from public service. And so they're unfamiliar with economic and civil cases. And so we need the capacity to train our judges. They're plenty, plenty intelligent, plenty bright, and wanting to, to learn. But we've had to change that, and we don't have the capability for that. I had to eliminate our whole division that did all of our research and development. All, all the kinds of, of evidence-based practices that we need to document, performance measures, all of that, that that makes good business sense, we had to cut all that because it was not part of our core function. But a sustainable court system, you know, the 13 million that we saved that was taken, that should have been dumped back into research and development. That, that, that's the way you provide a sustainable court system. And we should have been able to do that. And so we have to, we have to now, we're at the point now where we have to start going back up, and it has to be in the idea that it's a sustainable court system. This, Tom mentioned that we had to cut um, family facilitators and that sort of thing. I'm not sure many of you know, but uh, in 80% of the cases around our state and nationally in family law, at least one of the parties is unrepresented, and in 60% of the cases, both parties are unrepresented. And there's a phenomenon here that we, as court leaders, have to think about. The people who are now coming to our courts are used to finding information instantly here. They're used to being able to navigate electronically through any system, and they expect that of the court system. And we need to be able to deliver that, or we're going to start looking increasingly irrelevant if we can't deliver that. And we need to be able to meet the needs of these unrepresented people. Many of them could actually afford a lawyer, but their view is they ought to be able to navigate this system like they navigate all other systems electronically. And so we have to understand who are those new customers coming to us, if you will. And I think we also have to ask ourselves a serious question about whether the adversarial system is the right model for many of the kinds of cases in court. We have to ask ourselves, how much judicial resource should we be giving to certain kinds of cases? I think that's that, and I think that will fall on Tom's watch, where we start making qualitative assessments about how much time judicial time should go to certain categories of cases. I've been working with a group out of Denver called the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. It's headquartered in, uh, at the University of Denver Law School. And we have an initiative there called Honor, Honoring Families. And one of the, the research that we're doing is in family law, how much judicial resource do you really need there and, and is there, are there other ways in which you address those family needs in court? Because a small percentage of those cases takes up a lot of court time, qualitatively. And so we have to look at all of those, those kinds of things as we go forward. Well, I think we've started talking about some of the attributes of a healthy judicial system. And let's just tick off a couple of them. Paul uh, mentioned stable and adequate funding. It doesn't help to sort of give us a little more money because the state budget is better this year and then the, bud the budget's worse next year, so we'll cut you. That does not uh, provide for the sort of ongoing work that we need to do. The fact is our caseload does not change all that much. In fact, it tends to go up somewhat uh, when 
economic times are hard. There is more of certain times of, types of litigation. There tends to be uh, more uh, cases involving families and stress. Uh, so the sort of up and down uh, is not helpful. We need stable funding. Uh, we need more funding. Uh, we've talked about technology. We do need to embrace uh, technology, and we have with eCourt. As Paul said, uh, the legislature is, has been very supportive, and Judge Waller has been one of the key uh, folks in helping us implement our eCourt system, which we're now starting to roll out to the trial courts. We also have to be more collaborative, and there's a great example of collaboration in, in Multnomah County. The Gateway uh, Domestic Violence Center uh, is a place where women seeking restraining orders can go to a facility in Gateway uh, at, you know, out there uh, off, uh, off 205. Uh, they can uh, electronically uh, input their information into a, 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 a program that will produce the petition that they need. They can appear uh, by video uh, before a judge in down, at the downtown courthouse, and if they're entitled to it, they can get a restraining order that way. It's a collaboration of the city, the county, and the uh, courts, uh, and it is working very well, but it's an example of the kind of use we need to make of technology. Paul talked about the way we have centralized in Salem most of the post-conviction cases that we do, which most of you don't know anything about, but it is a large part of uh, of our workload. Um, a, we, we need to be innovative. Uh, that A healthy court system is innovative in the ways both Paul and I have talked about. It's innovative in providing a variety of services to the people who need the courts to act on their cases, whether it's mediation, whether it's court annexed arbitration, whether it's uh, a settlement conference with the judge, or whether it's a full-blown jury trial in a civil or, or criminal case. We need to, uh, a healthy court system will be able to respond to the many self-represented people who come into our courts. And again, uh, Multnomah County is, has been very active in looking at ways to help self-represented people, give them the resources both uh, in terms of library resources and in terms of people helping them figure out how to access the justice system if they don't have an, a lawyer or don't want a lawyer. Um, Paul, you've had uh, a lot of involvement with making our, our court system safe for employees and for the public that comes in. Why don't you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll very quickly go over that. You know, one, at, one attribute of a sustainable court system is having adequate, safe facilities. And I, I don't have to tell those of you who follow the courts about what's going on with the Multnomah County court system, but when I became chief in 2006, uh, I, I hadn't been out to the trial courts for um, well, o over um, 15 years. And I made a tour, uh, and I was appalled by the state of our county court courthouses, and made it a priority to start working on that. And it, it, you can imagine that was a multiple legislative session undertaking because we were first hit with this is a county problem, not a state problem. We made an arrangement with the counties back in 1983 when we unified the court system, and that's not our problem. Well, the truth is it changed over all of these years, and it is a state issue. And we have made some really great strides there. Um, we, we started from a flat no to a $1.5 million study of the, funded by the state of all the courthouses. Prioritization and ranking of what needed to be repaired, replaced, um, all, all of that. The next session, we were able to get um, $12 million in stimulus money on 32 projects, county courthouses that, that we got through. Last session, two bills were passed in which is the start of establishing accounts to put money in to start matching with counties to repair and replace these aging facilities. What we've also been able to do is we now have statewide security standards in our courthouses, which we had never had before. And we were able, we were able to fund that and able to work with the counties. It's a, it was a good example of collaboration 
in many places um, where we were able to really enhance the security of our courthouses, and that is, I think, extremely important. And I would say, um, for Tom particularly, because this will come up on his watch, um, one, of the, one, one thing about a sustainable court system is you need to be able to attract, recruit, and retain competent judges. And compensation has something to do with that, but we need to be able to do that in, as we go forward in, in the future. One other thing that uh, I think is an attribute of a, of a healthy court system, and this comes under the innovation heading, uh, is being able to introduce new ways of, of doing adjudication, including some of the problem-solving courts that we've had great success with, whether it's drug courts, family courts, mental health courts. Uh, we have some veterans dockets uh, uh, around the state right now. Uh, the difficulty with uh, some of these innovative ways of dealing with social problems like this that come up as legal problems is that it takes a lot of court time. It is very easy for us. We can uh, take guilty pleas and sentence people for drug crimes or for property crimes that are clearly drug-based. We can do 20, 40, 50 of those a day. We can come in and take the plea, say, okay, you get three, you know, six months in jail, you know, you get a year, you're gonna go to prison. Uh, to, but that's not best necessarily in terms of overall social costs. Uh, it turns out to be, in many circumstances, much more cost effective to say, look, if you can get yourself clean, go to drug treatment, look for a job, provide a clean UA, your analysis, uh, and uh, come back and see me next week, and if you're on track, we're not gonna uh, put you in jail, uh, then we'll do that week after week. That is very intensive of, of, of judge time. It saves a lot of money in terms of corrections, in terms of the crimes prevented, in terms of the overall social costs of having additional criminal activity, uh, but it, uh, it takes additional money, and if we don't have the judges to put in the time for drug courts or mental health courts, then we can't do this cost-effective work. So, uh, one more attribute of uh, a uh, healthy judicial system. So that overall, I think a, a healthy functioning judicial system requires constant innovation and looking for efficiencies. And Paul didn't say it, I guess it's, it's clear to everybody, crew meant we sort of all are rowing together. Yeah, we're still you know, we're all it. Now, we've got 191 judges and uh, 1,500 employees, and I was managing partner of a law firm, but uh, it's getting all these judges and, and employees rowing together is not, not as easy as you might think. But people are, are very uh, supportive of, of these efforts. So we need to spend the public's money wisely. We've done that, uh, and we will continue to do that. But we also need more revenues. Uh, and let me just say a little bit about that, because the governor's recommended budget came out today. Uh, it is essentially a, you know, the revenue forecast is not continuing to drop precipitously, but it's not going up dramatically either. Uh, there are some good things happening in terms of, of the budget. Uh, we have, for the first time, a group of legislators uh, who came to us and said, we would like to be the, the core of a court's caucus within the legislature. Uh, Representative Garrett uh, uh, from Portland uh, on the Democratic side in the House, and Wally Hicks, uh, uh, Republican from downstate, on, uh, also in the House, were sort of the instigators of this. But that's, that's a good development. The uh, Oregon State Bar and the Multnomah Bar Association uh, have uh, decided to make court funding uh, a key priority of theirs and to help us talk to the legislature. The business community has been very supportive, and we're looking for support wherever we can get it. The fact is there are a number of other very uh, worthy needs throughout the state, uh, and there are people who can make strong pitches to the legislature for more money for uh, their programs, K through 12, uh, education, and 
human services being the uh, sort of the strongest. Uh, but we have a good case to make too. We are, and I hope some of the examples we've given uh, show you, we are in many ways a human services agency. Uh, and we have uh, uh, a good story to tell and we're hopeful that the legislature will, will be listening uh, during this session and, and the next session because this is not sort of a one-time effort. Uh, we have to be uh, working every day to help create an accessible and open and fully functioning court system. It's what I uh, wake up in the middle of the night worrying about. Paul doesn't have to worry about it quite as much as he used to. <laughs> but um, let me, uh, we're gonna go, we're, we're supposed to wrap up here, but, but let me close uh, uh, with this thought. The, uh, the reason, and this is sort of implicit, why is it important to have a healthy court system? Well, the courts are absolutely a core function of government. This is where your rights get protected, your economic rights, your civil liberties, your constitutional rights. This is where a society enforces its rules, namely our criminal laws. This is where we make sure everybody's playing uh, by the rules of the game and everybody is entitled to their day in court and they, don't, they should not have to wait like they do in Los Angeles in a civil case five or six years uh, to get there. Um, and in Oregon, in addition to sort of all this important, the important role the court plays in the lives of the people who need court services, whether it's family law matters, criminal matters, or civil matters, in Oregon, every major political uh, or social or economic issue comes to the courts, whether it's PERS reform, whether it's uh, who uh, does the public have a right to the uh, dry sand area and the beaches, uh, whether it's Measure 37, whether it's the death penalty, uh, all these matters end up in the Oregon courts and eventually they end up uh, in the Supreme Court. And we need to have a system that attracts good judges, that functions quickly uh, and uh, provides uh, the sort of justice services and the sort of justice uh, and enforcement of the rule of law that the people of Oregon deserve. Well, I think Pat wants to... You, you, Pat, there's Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both very much for a very informative discussion about our court system. Now is the time, uh, if you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high so the City Club staff can collect it from you. Thank you very much. As always, the first question for our speaker will come from today's Friday Forum host. Today that host is Rob Aldesert. Rob has practiced law for 22 years specializing in trial work and appeals cases involving business disputes. He currently serves as the Portland Managing Partner for Perkins Coie. Rob recently chaired the City Club's PERS Study Committee and is leading its advocacy efforts for the study's recommendations. Rob? Thanks, Pat. Your Honors, uh, speaking of PERS, uh, although none of our uh, City Club recommendations were directed to the judiciary. In the course of our research and investigation, many witnesses uh, across the political spectrum, spectrum said that PERS issues and legislation uh, can never get a fair and impartial hearing in the courts because the judges deciding the cases are in the very awkward position of being PERS members themselves and thus have a financial stake in the outcome of the cases. Uh, one suggestion we heard was that a special PERS court be formed consisting of volunteer pro tem judges who are not PERS members and otherwise have no conflict. And so my question is, do you agree that judges being members of PERS creates a problem when deciding PERS cases? And in any event, do you have any suggestion for changes in the way uh, judicial review is carried on, such as a pro tem court that would address these concerns? Well, that, that's a good question. Let me start by saying that <clears throat> judges are PERS members, but we are not uh, members of regular, the regular PERS system. And the uh, benefits that go to judges are uh, different from, and uh, in, in some respects, uh, substantially less generous than uh, the benefits that uh, at least tier one PERS members got. Uh, judge, the judge part of uh, of PERS, uh, if you uh, are a judge for more than 22 years and you agree to 
uh, to provide 35 days of free service for five years after you retire, uh, you can get a maximum of 75 percent uh, of your salary. Uh, and that's, uh, that's assuming you became a uh, judge long enough, that you, uh, long enough ago that you were able to serve you know, 22 years, which for a lot of people doesn't happen. Tom, so, you never should have disclosed that. <laughs> uh, the, it, it, and Paul uh, can, can answer on, on this too. The, there, there is a long-standing uh, judicial rule called the rule of necessity uh, that says that uh, although judges should recuse themselves if they have a conflict of interest, uh, that uh, if uh, everybody would have a conflict of interest, certainly all the judges, then uh, they may hear the case. And it is, is on that basis that this court has decided a number of PERS issues uh, over the past, uh, actually we've been deciding these cases for, uh, for decades. Uh, and I think that, that rule is correct. I think it's an abdication of the court's responsibility to say uh, we're going to choose some non-PERS uh, never been official judges since anybody who's been uh, an elected or appointed regular judge would have the same kind of conflict. Uh, essentially pick seven lawyers uh, at random and make them pro tem judges uh, and have them decide a PERS case. I don't think that makes any sense. I think we, uh, it, it's like cases where uh, we are asked to decide something that, uh, uh, you know, interpret a statute that we may never have voted for, that we would not have voted for. Uh, we uh, decide cases all the time uh, that are inconsistent with our personal views of, of that uh, social or law enforcement matter. And the fact is we took on these, this job to decide difficult cases. Uh, we were elected by the people of the state to decide these cases, and I think we should decide those cases. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum is a privilege of City Club membership. Uh, you also have the opportunity to join and become a member if you'd like more opportunities to ask questions at the Friday Forum. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question as directly as possible. If I flash the famous question mark, um, that means please wrap up your question. Thank you very much. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, you've made the case, I think, very convincingly that you need stable and adequate funding. Um, as you're well aware, Oregon has this quirky law called the kicker, and uh, I'm wondering what your view is about uh, changing that law. He, uh, the, the well, chief, Paul's returning to the private sector I, I, yeah. soon. So. <laughs> the Chief Justice wanted to avoid that question. <laughs> so uh, obviously uh, one of the things that we have tried to studiously avoid are these questions about where the revenue uh, comes from, uh, whether it's general fund money, whether it's some other special appropriation. Uh, an, ex uh, an analogy was measures 66 and 67. I was chief during that period, and I, I tried assiduously not to take a position about that, although the proponents of Measure 66 and 67 oftentimes in public said, well, you want a court system adequately funded, don't you vote for this? Uh, and, and my question, I wish I had had a letter in my pocket from you saying that's where the revenue would go. So we've tried very hard at such a political hot potato to try to, to stay away from that. And kind of the, one of the overall reasons for that is it goes back to my very first comments in those where we can't fund our own operations, we can't enforce our own orders. The only thing we have going for us is our, the trust and confidence of the public and the other branches in, of, of government. And so the best that we can do is try to conduct ourselves um, both personally and professionally with the highest standards and to be prudent, prudent managers of the resources that are given to us. Karen? Hi, Sharon Robbins, City Club member. You both made great points about how you can harness new technologies to get efficiencies and better access. I'm wondering if you think some innovation 
might need to be considered for the historic kind of overlay of counties and jurisdictions and municipalities that we use, mm -hmm. not just for the court systems, but for all of the different social services and educational services. Yeah, uh, Tom looked at me because I tried that. Um, part of the part part of the whole reengineering of the court system that I was interested in was creating administrative efficiencies and not not being uh, hamstrung by artificial county lines for venue. So, for example, one of the things we did is we have our complex litigation court, which says we are going to consider our judges a statewide resource and we're not going to be hamstrung by these parochial venue things. But when I tried to talk about administrative consolidation of counties, that got nowhere in, in, the, in the legislative system. But let me, let me bring one other point to it. One of the things that we have been trying to do for a number of years now, and the chief has assigned this to me even in my retirement, is the idea of thinking about our judges as statewide resources, not thinking about them county to county. There is no reason today, I mean, we've got to work through this, but there is no reason today that a judge in Lakeview couldn't do arraignments by video, couldn't do other kinds of motions, and that sort of thing. And so one of the things that the chief has tasked of me, which I, I started and didn't complete during my term, is to really organize and orchestrate this as using our judges as a statewide resource. And I think we will get a tremendous bang for our buck if we can start to do that. Hey, here, I look forward to that. Debbie Lynn Molino, City Club member. And uh, my question for you is you mentioned uh, questioning the adversarial system as, as being the best system for many cases. Uh, and I think you said especially in, in uh, terms of family law and family cases. And I wondered if you could expand on that a little bit more yeah. and talk more about what other systems there could be or other options. Yeah, sure. I, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'll follow up on something Tom said. Um, when Tom was talking about drug courts, treatment courts, Vet, uh, veterans courts, um, mental health courts, he was talking about a problem-solving model. This is a, a problem-solving model of a court system. It's not an adversarial process. And I think the adversarial, this is, I'm speaking for me now. I'm not speaking for the Chief Justice, but I think that the adversarial model in family law punishes children, punishes families, and that we ought to be thinking innovatively about how we do something else so that we try to we try to maintain family stability both economically and psychologically that we, that we don't punish children in this adversarial system and i think we have to think creatively about doing that this sort of uh, ties into the idea of having a variety of ways of resolving disputes uh, but still have the backup of a trial before a judge. And we need to, people want the array of, uh, of options. Doesn't mean we're gonna give everybody every option because the fact is, you know, the judges do know better than the family members sometimes. Uh, you know, how these things are gonna play out. They've seen a thousand cases like this before. But, uh, but certainly that model or other sorts of, uh, of mediation or arbitration efforts in other, outside the family law, context, uh, I think is something that we have to be able to offer. And let me just add to the, the point Paul was making before about the administrative uh, efficiencies. There are some things that we, we are trying to do and we will try to do uh, to uh, surpass or, or to, to uh, not circumvent statutes, but to uh, avoid unnecessary problems about things happening in one county or another. and share the judges as statewide resources, but also be looking at our court staff. Uh, if they've got time out in, in a county, can we send somebody from one county to another county to work there to help out a special need? Re this really has to be managed as one system, not as 27 little systems. May it please the court. Uh, <laughs> uh, Your Honors, Dwight Holton, uh, 
uh, city club member. So if we're going to ultimately reduce crime seriously, reduce victimization seriously, and reduce the costs that that imposes on the court system, we need to have uh, courts at the local level engaged much more seriously in all sorts of innovative programs that we have great examples of that folks like Judge Mar Waller and Judge Maurer have been real leaders on, reentry, uh, other drug court efforts, recidivism efforts. How do we push on those innovative programs that in the long term, these are investments, and we're going to save money as well as saving victimization and crime, how do we do that while also trying to meet the basic needs? Thank you, Dwight. The chief lateraled that one to me. Uh, I, I, I suspect because of, I'm chairing the Commission on Public Safety, which the governor has charged with looking at exactly what Mr. Holton uh, is talking about. And one of the, w what we're looking at with the kinds of policy changes that may be made is reinvesting those savings that we may make with changes in correctional policy by not building more prisons and reinvesting that money in the justice system to make the public more safe. That we have, we have uh, all kinds of scientific research and evidence-based practices now that show us how we can make the public more safe with community-based programs, with supervised programs. Let me just give you one statistic. If we wanted to save money, there are 14,000 prisoners in our, in, our, in our 14 prisons around the country. If you take a snapshot any given day of who's in prison, 46% of those prisoners either failed on probation or failed on post-prison supervision. In other words, they don't need to be there. If we, it, 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 they, they don't have to be there. It costs $85 a day to incarcerate a person in a state prison. It costs $12 a day to manage them in the community. And we have the science and the research to change cremogenic thinking now. We have the support through reentry services, and we need to change our priorities to do that. If we can reduce the recidivism rate by 1%, we save $4 million a year just by reducing it by 1%. Uh, in Marion County, for example, where I live, we have a Marion County reentry initiative. We get six to 700 prisoners a year. If you're in that Marion County reentry initiative, there's only an 8% recidivism rate as opposed to the statewide recidivism rate of 28 to 30%. So there, are, and, and, and that is Dwight's point where we, you stop victimizing people. This, it, these are public safety programs that actually make the community safer and we know how to do that now and we have to reorient our policies in a way and reinvest that money in those community-based programs. We have run out of time, broadcast time, for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. However, our speakers are happy to stay to answer the rest of your questions. Please join us next week for my, behind, my life behind the mic, 43 years with Portland Trail Blazers announcer Bill Shonley.